So looking at the, um, the Canadian situation, there are a number of initiatives right now uh, wh which are endorsing evidence-based medicine. There is a tremendous momentum and there are a lot of reflections on how can we improve the healthcare systems. From the uh, Commission on the Future of Healthcare in Canada by uh, Romanov and the, the report that is expecting to be released uh, in, a, in a short uh, period of time. Uh, which definitely endorses um, evidence-based medicine and uh, decision support systems as a means to increase efficiencies and quality of care. Um, the Kirby Senate Committee also came uh, with a report recently that was also endorsing such, a, such an approach. Uh, Canada, Canada Health Infoway is a consortium that has a budget of $500 million dollars dedicated to uh, enhancing healthcare through the adoption of uh, healthcare IT technologies. One of their uh, approaches being to have clinical solutions based on evi with evidence-based medicine. And actually the Kirby report was advising to uh, increase their budget from 500 million to 2 billion uh, since they were just uh, really feeling that uh, this was key to the future of Canadian health, uh, the healthcare systems. You have a number of initiatives also at the level of provinces like the Institute of Health Economy <coughs> of Alberta who's been looking at uh, diabetes and also uh, employing evidence-based medicine as a means to, uh, to improve things. Uh, the, uh, in Ontario, the, um, the Ontario uh, uh, Cancer here is also uh, looking at uh, evidence-based medicine, so this approach has a lot of uh, momentum at this point. Um, that was kind of <laughs> concluding on how we've uh, applied such an approach with Brigham and Women and how we see that it's important given the, uh, the, the trends that we see in the healthcare uh, systems and the, the attention that uh, such an approach of knowledge management has towards healthcare. What we would like to do now is to show you the actual application as it is being used today uh, by Brigham and Women uh, um, healthcare providers across the, uh, the partners network. And as you can see, this is the application as it is running there. We've been, uh, we've been changing our logo and we've been changing the product name from Radvise. I think we're losing a little bit of, uh, of information on the screen there, I'll try to manage, uh, towards Percipio because Percipio is, uh, is broader than just dealing with radiology orders. So I'll just run through the system. Imagine a primary care physician who is just uh, launching his web browser and uh, typing the URL corresponding to the, uh, to the application. Uh, by the way, I don't think we've mentioned that, but the system that the people from Boston are using today is hosted in our facility in Waterloo, so it's an ASP type of application which people reach through the internet. This is not that instance of the application though? So this is a demonstration copy, so you won't be seeing real patient data. That's right. So I don't want anybody to go home and uh, call the newspaper and say... <laughs> So what I'm going to do is go through the overall uh, process of ordering, um, ordering a study. I thought I would. Let me see if I can do that from another place then. And uh, showing you a number of uh, knowledge, reference that are provided within the care, of, within the process of um, of dealing with that patient as well as then closing the loop of providing the results back to the, uh, to the reference physician. Um, what I have here is, is a demonstration which is um, a bit uh, that has some functionality uh, on top of what we have at uh, Brigham today. It's using our IntelliGo portal and basically what this is doing is providing the user with a customized view of his desktop where he has access to uh, like typical pages, for instance a page that you cannot see is my outlook. What you would have if I would click there is just see my schedule, my emails, my tasks, uh, or his own page which is showing um, his practice uh, management uh, application. So that's the, uh, the software that uh, is used in the practice to manage schedules and to manage some of the, uh, the, the patient information and to manage the, uh, the primary care facility actually. And uh, here we have Percipio or Advice, um, or actually here we have the inbox. But so basically, typically, um, I'm a primary care physician in this example of the demonstration, though I'm not a physician, but just for the sake of the demonstration. And I'm uh, examining a patient called Emma Anderson. Uh, Emma has uh, had breast cancer 
and she's got a mastectomy. So she's coming back to my practice after the mastectomy and there is a suspicion that maybe she has some metastasis. So I'm going to try to see if I can order some diagnostic tests to, to validate that assumption or at least to make sure that she doesn't have any metastasis. So in the schedule from my office practice management software, I'm just selecting Emma, who's the patient who's just uh, arrived. And what this is doing is, this is launching an electronic patient record application uh, in the context of that patient. So now I'm in the EPR and I can view all of the records of, uh, of Emma uh, and uh, check whatever information <coughs> I want about her. Or I can, and then I can move forward and decide uh, to go and order some diagnostic tests for her. And what this is going to do is, here I have Radvise or Precipio, the Medicalis application, which is uh, launched in a generic way. And as I'm going to uh, start moving from the uh, electronic patient record into Radvise, then the context into the Medicalis application is immediately set as now I have Emma who is selected for me. And I'm into the ordering uh, mode, so I'm able to select a number of exams. Typically the, um, the care path or the, the diagnostic exams that would be done for such a patient would be to order a CT of the chest and the abdomen to check again for metastasis, as well as a NUCMED uh, bone density scan. Uh, the physician can order in, uh, in a number of ways, either through uh, an extensive list of uh, exams that are available to him or uh, through uh, shortcuts that uh, he can select from to, uh, to, get, uh, to get a pre-canned order so that he doesn't have to, to enter all of the information again. So hidden here behind I have my CT chest and abdomen. Uh, and now I'm prompted to provide additional information about that patient and that order. Uh, and basically, I think I haven't, I haven't started the, uh, the right order, so let me start again. Since I, since I had my button hidden. So I'm going to order a CT chest and abdomen now, and I'm prompted to enter additional information. So that patient um, is asymptomatic, but I just would like to make sure. I know she has breast malign malignancy, she's had an operation for that, uh, and I, I, I have a suspicion of a metastasis, a metastatic disease. So that's the type of structured information that you want to for the order, and you can add some additional comments. Submitting your order, and then the system is prompted for, is providing more information. I know that this patient has some allergies, and the, the, the user is just notified of that. Okay, let me proceed. Um, and basically, because I've ordered a CAT scan of the abdomen and the chest, it's very likely that there's going to be a contrast medium injection uh, during that procedure. And we know the patient has an allergy to that contrast medium. And the, the, the system is prompted for additional information about that allergy. We know she's getting hives, and we know that we want, we want to use uh, a higher, smaller contrast uh, agent. And so I'm submitting this. In this very particular situation, uh, with pre-medication, the, uh, the test and the fact that contrast medium is going to be injected is not going to be harmful for the patient. So it's important that the patient gets this pre-medication uh, before the, uh, the, CAT, the CAT scan can happen. And so the physician is upstream uh, prompted that this pre-medication is important for, uh, for the sake of, uh, of this study and is going to be able to inform the patient. So I'm going to just uh, proceed with that order uh, and it's been saved and accepted. Uh, and I'm just going to, uh, to, to continue and go with uh, the second test that I would like to order for that patient, which is uh, NUCMED uh, bone density. So I'm just going to uh, create another order. And here, selecting that order through the uh, length, through the complete list, and again, providing similar information. The patient is asymptomatic. I know that she's got uh, primary breast um, uh, malignancy and we're trying to see if there is some metastatic disease. 
Now here this is a type of uh, knowledge uh, reference which is provided or decision support which is looking beyond just the CAT scan or the, the NUCMED sorry, that I'm ordering and which is trying to think is there another procedure which could be outside of the radiology spectrum that would be more appropriate and so the system is prompting the physician that for that type of sign and symptom and, uh, and indications blood work should be performed before the uh, NUCMED uh, is performed uh, and based on the outcome of the blood work then the NUCMED might be appropriate or uh, might not be needed and so the next step is for the physician to either decide that he wants to continue there is complete flexibility it's really the decision is up to the physician the system is not uh, providing uh, direction that it's just providing some some tips for the physician to be more efficient so the physician can overrule or can just decide to continue so uh, here is just accepting the advice and uh, he's going to order lab work instead of this uh, NICMED um, we're currently in the progress of, uh, of implementing the, uh, the, the lab functionality, so you see that we have less of a structured order entry form. Uh, you would uh, put information here manually, and you can select uh, your CBC and uh, other uh, blood work that would be relevant for, uh, for this specific patient condition, and check at all time what you've ordered. So this CBC panel, and I could do the same with, uh, with other uh, chemistry work. Um, proceeding with uh, this typically the patient would be then uh, going to the front desk and try to get the CAT scan uh, order scheduled so that the patient can leave with the practice with uh, all of the information related to that CAT scan so what I'm going to do is um, get uh, back into the system typically what I would do is so the patient has been examined goes into the front desk and uh, the front desk uh, receptionist is going, to, uh, is going to schedule that order for, uh, for the physician. And so the patient is still here and uh, as a receptionist I'm just going to go into my work list of unscheduled orders and I'm going to pick, now I haven't really made my order for quite some time obviously, but I'm going to pick uh, the one that we've just ordered and, and proceed with it. So it's a CT chest and abdomen uh, and I can see the ordering information, the insurance, again we've mentioned charge capture which is important especially uh, and uh, I'm just able to, uh, to proceed here and schedule that order. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's the one we just created Patricia. Sorry? I don't think it's the one we just created. Okay. So I'll just go very quickly. We, we always forget to remember what that order number was. You need to one. remember that very, very number. And obviously uh, I've selected uh, one with a one digit difference. So I'm redoing exactly the same thing. And I'm just going to continue and then proceed and uh, <coughs> sorry and create so the order has been saved and now it's available for me to schedule typically it would have been just picked out of the work list but I didn't select the right one sorry for that and so now what is provided to me is the uh, the the, uh, the availability of the various radiology sites that I have access to as a primary care physician so I'm uh, affiliated with two or three different radiology departments, in this specific example three different radiology departments and I can see which time slots are available for a CAT scan uh, on the, uh, the type of modality that I need for my procedure and select the one which is the most appropriate for the patient or for me um, and just pick one time slot and, uh, and proceed and schedule that CAT scan. Again, avoiding the typical workflow whereby the physician is going to write on a quick note uh, or on a form some information that he passes to the receptionist who then is uh, you know, doing a number of calls and uh, trying to get the radiology department and schedule for that order. So right now this order has been scheduled successfully and the patient can uh, be informed while he's still in the practice 
and you can print a requisition letter, give him a letter so he has all of the uh, pre-medication information, the direction on how to go to the hospital, etc., etc. So that would be kind of the end of this patient examination. Patient leaves, goes to the radiology department, the test is being performed, and normally the results would come back. The physician would be prompted if it's an abnormal result. Now I can't show you that part because obviously uh, Emma has not gone to a radiology department in the, uh, in the time frame of this demonstration. Uh, but what I can show you is typically what would happen. The uh, physician could have been prompted on his, uh, on his uh, wireless device that, uh, that an abnormal result has come back and then we'd be able to either view a summary of that information in here or goes back into his practice, looks at his work list of reports that he hasn't seen yet or reports that requires an, action to, uh, an urgent action and uh, just look at them. Here he's got the snapshot. Uh, we've just enabled a quick overview of what the report is. Depending on the color codes, you see whether it's uh, an action required type of item, whether it's something that has not been read. So we've used color code as a, as a means to, uh, to help going very fast into your uh, clinical workflow. And if I'm selecting a report, then I'm getting again all of the patient information, the order information, as well as the details of that result that came out of radiology. Um, and here we have uh, what we call the result code, which is this little piece of structured information that's important to trigger the risk management back. If it's abnormal, then uh, the system is automatically going to notify the referring physician back that he needs to be <coughs> doing something. And it's also going to help on the, uh, the following, the follow-up. Uh, whether uh, there should be some, uh, some additional, uh, if whether there's been some changes related to the exams, if there were any, and whether some follow-ups would be organized or not. And then the physician can complete his review, add some additional uh, impression that he has, uh, and just complete the review or decide to review this again later to organize some, uh, some subsequent follow-up. That's kind of, again, closing the loop of ordering, being provided with uh, online references and medical knowledge that enhance the ordering process, making sure that it's the most appropriate study which is ordered, um, as well as then being provided with the results back, being triggered, alerted if needed, and having the ability to review the, uh, the report in textual form, as well as images. We haven't displayed that here, but that's, that's also a possibility. And just closing the loop of trying to improve uh, healthcare or streamline the workflows. All of this implemented in a very flexible manner, whereby each single piece of advice that you've seen can be turned on and off. Uh, so the organization can decide whether they will want a certain piece of advice to be turned on or off at the level of the organization, at the level of a practice, at the level of a single user. If you have more junior uh, users, for instance, you may want to provide them with more decision support than for the most specialized or senior uh, doctors. And I think that's concluding the demonstration of the technology to give you an idea of what is actually uh, being used uh, at this point uh, in, in Boston and how we embed knowledge within the clinical workflow in a way that we try to make it as flexible uh, and as little intrusive as possible. A quick summary then. Um, some of the points we wanted to make, and we hope we made at least some of them, uh, just-in-time knowledge, evidence-based decision support does improve healthcare. Uh, we talked about static knowledge, really sort of like a digital, med digital medical textbook uh, provides a lot of value, but also the, the dynamic knowledge that you can uh, achieve through uh, the acquisition, collection of large data sets, and uh, being able to provide sort of uh, comparative information back to the referring physician at the time that they're making order. Also, in general, there's many things that technology can do to improve healthcare, and uh, one of the things that what we concentrate on is really linking the primary care providers with the diagnostic test centers. Uh, you can really improve the level of care. Uh, and involvement that the, uh, the patient experiences. And you can see a lot of system-wide efficiencies and how resources are utilized. The pri primary care provider uh, can provide a lot of richer content uh, at the time of ordering, that at the time of ordering that can be used during the, uh, the actual test that's being performed. And uh, also, uh, quite significantly, the results are available back to the primary care physician uh, quickly and easily, allowing us to reduce the total turnaround time uh, for the uh, assumption, test, diagnosis cycle. 
That brings us to the end, Dominic. Thank you. I'd like to turn this over to questions or comments from the audience, but maybe uh, one question for you that I'd also like some reaction from uh, Rena, if she's still here. Not sure, Rena, if you have lost, there you are. Uh, how do you see this technology you've developed uh, being an innovation compared to other technologies currently on the shelf within industry? I'll take a whack at it. Uh, I think I think there are a lot of good technologies out there for uh, uh, doing uh, order entry, um, computerized order entry for physicians. Uh, certainly we think some of the value adds for some of the work we're doing here and what we're trying to push the edges is integrating the decision support into those workflows. So uh, there may be, Patricia mentioned there are many ways for this to be introduced into the workflows. One of the ways we're looking at doing is even providing access to these decision support engines within the user interface of, uh, of let's say, other providers of this type of software. I think the other sort of innovation and value add you see here is a, uh, a focus on integrating the primary care provider with the diagnostic test centers. Uh, I think that's somewhat uh, novel and uh, I, I think uh, we, we have some experience there. A lot of us have a, a background in the department that allows us to be rather innovative and uh, leading edge in that sense. Oh, you have one. In terms of innovation, there, yeah, yeah, there, there, there is. Any you'd like to yeah. so. In terms of the um, the source of knowledge or the 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 way to create and then to provide the knowledge back into the the clinical workflow, there is also an innovation there whereby using this uh, coded result information and. Uh, Gathering a large warehouse of, uh, of clinical information that we can that we can then mine to provide extra information to provide extra references and give that uh, live uh, into the uh, making it making it available to the physician is also uh, quite an innovation compared with medical uh, online libraries, for instance, that require more proactive uh, management of knowledge and that are based on more static knowledge, things that have been publicized. Here we just gather and collect a ba base of information that then can be mined in any fashion to create new knowledge, which is then either validated by a clinical advisory board and then re-embedded into a guideline or a rule, or which is just used and mined in real time and provided as statistics for reference to the physician while he's working. Rita, can I put you on the spot? Well, I mean, probably can hear me. I would agree that um, that's probably the most exciting piece of it would be from our perspective because I think that the management of uh, handling, getting, reviewing all the information and then being able to feed it back to the physicians in a way that they can use it is, uh, is a, a really um, interesting aspect that you've managed to uh, do. And I, I think the other thing that's uh, different from the system that we're looking at right now is just far more open. And uh, that's really great when you're trying to hook up disparate systems. And that's a real problem in the hospitals today. Excellent. Other comments or questions? Rick or Patricia, what do you see as the change management challenge in getting physicians to buy into something like this? You can start. The, well, the ch change management is, first thing, just have the, the physician adopt the use of a computer, especially if he's used to doing manual entry. And I think what's really important is to, uh, to show uh, him the value that he's getting, what's in it for him in terms of what value does he get, which is availability of information immediately. The simple fact of being able to review the result or being prompted diminishing the, the risk uh, in terms of uh, taking care of his patient or the patient care uh, as well as again reviewing the results or being provided with novel new information new uh, and latest medical knowledge while he's doing his, uh, his, his, his routine work I think has a lot of value so there is definitely an adoption curve that has to be uh, to be to be managed and usually a, an approach that that we've seen as, as successful is just to make sure that for each of the sites where the application is deployed, we identify a champion, someone who's really 
take the benefit of the application and who's then going to be able to show it to all of the other uh, doctors and users of that facility and show them the advantage why they're working uh, so that then the system is being used and as it's used the base of knowledge grows and it's just it's kind of a snowball effect. I think the other thing you do too is you, you reduce to a bare minimum any changes uh, in the workplace environment. If a radiologist is used to voice recording their reports, uh, you can't have them go have to click to this result code and you need to do, you know, incorporate that into their voice. Uh, if they're used to um, uh, you know, a, a certain way of signing things, again, you have to integrate into those processes and, and in that add value in as uh, uh, small as possible and as, as possible. And feedback we're getting from the healthcare community is absolutely critical there. Just making sure that the user interface is going to be uh, appealing and, and convenient for the, for the user and making sure that we adapt to different types and different styles of users. Uh, a physician, primary care physician or a specialist may have different needs, uh, may have different workflows, may need different shortcuts, different structured information presented to him uh, and um, a physician staff for instance will need again an, another style of user interfaces so for us gathering feedback related to uh, user needs, user preferences is absolutely critical to make sure that we in turn are able to customize the application to their, uh, to their requirements to facilitate that adoption curve. John? A couple of questions. One uh, language is the issue that is you have this database down there that you're attempting to mine to show people what has already happened. It wasn't quite clear to me. Are you handling language by in effect restricting what people can do or or is there something else I didn't see? Um, let me try to answer that a little bit. Uh, where possible we're using standards for encoding information. There's a couple of standards called ICD-9 codes. Those are standard mechanisms for encoding the symptoms and indications. So although we're using words there, really those map to standardized codes and behind the scenes. Also for the types of tests that are ordered, there's some things called CPT-4 codes. Uh, those are rather standard in the U.S. They're not used everywhere. Like I said before, there are many legacy systems that use their own. But in terms of putting the database together, we are really um, utilizing standards or where there are no standards, trying to create some um, normal forms of encoding that information. The question is, how are you? Um, our application has all the services required to uh, allow institutions to deploy this and uh, meet their HIPAA compliance regulations. But, uh, there's full, uh, it, it really, uh, when someone asks me how HIPAA compliant is, I, I try to say there's, there's really a couple of major aspects, and that's really uh, secure user authentication. Uh, so there's a single point of authentication. Um, that center point also manages access control. So there's a bunch of configuration screens. You know, this user has access to these types of uh, systems, uh, as well as auditing who, who's accessing what information uh, at all times. So there's actually audit logs that trail all that sort of stuff. And one of the things we don't show today is some of the administrative reports you can uh, generate that allow you to track back and, and find all those things that HIPAA wants, uh, uh, requires that you need to be able to answer. One thing that we do as well is we, we separate the warehouse of information that we use to mine and create new knowledge from the operational database of the institution. So where the live patient information is stored is, is the, the institution database. It's a separate one from the warehouse where the information is collected from, the, from various operational databases, but it's de-identified. So what we have is is mine of patient information, but we're not able to get back to the individual who's got that study. Question here. Uh, you have a large, I guess you call it a static uh, knowledge or static database, and I think you said earlier that that actually changes quite a bit to these new studies and, and new best practices. Uh, do you somehow sort of bump the position that you know, in these <coughs> circumstances, you know, maybe there's been a change in what the best practice and treatment is? I'll, I'll answer that question on um, uh, in, in two ways. One, I think um, the the static evidence that we talk about is not static in the sense that it's hard coded in the application. There's a complete rules database. 
that uh, we expect that customers will subscribe to, and that will be updated on a very frequent basis. Uh, as more knowledge and more rules become available, that gets put out there, and that will just affect how the application runs. In terms of the dynamic rules, uh, sorry, the dynamic feedback, the dynamic feedback is more in the sense of uh, d just doing comparative analysis, looking at the indications for the current order that's coming in, comparing that against a, a warehouse of orders that have those similar indications, and looking at the types of studies that were ordered and or the results from those. And, and that's something, that's just, that's just statistical feedback that comes to the physician all the time, and that just builds up over, over time. Uh, one of the things we, we believe, based on some of the physician feedback we've had, is in terms of that dynamic knowledge, we even have to, to scope that so that the physician may know that, you know, in all of, well, let's say Ontario, you know, these are the types of statistics you get back because they may be different than California. You know, there are environmental conditions and, and, and cultural conditions that uh, um, may actually skew the results. So not only, not only do you have to provide that dynamic feedback, but you have to scope that and say, you know, where are those results coming from? But I was thinking more in terms of the static rules and, and when will the rules change? It's nice to know there has been a change. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I don't know if you're a medical professional, I'm actually an accountant, but the way I used to keep track of changes in the calendar room is I follow the paper update and not let you know that there's been a change in something. Yeah. Um, and these large databases, it's sometimes hard to know there's something new. You know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, there's sort of problem to see. In this circumstance, you put a change in the best practice. One, one of the things, one of the, our, our goal would always be to put out the most recent rules and that's something that would just continually get published you know, a little bit like you know, on my, my Norton I get you know, my new virus rules downloaded automatically. Uh, one of the things we did not illustrate here was the ability to actually go in and get more feedback on these rules and I can also imagine that part of that literature would be sort of a history of how the rules have changed. So you can go back into the literature but also you know, this is a rule that's just changed recently. This is what people believe is new evidence and is the best practice. And, and the way the reference information is prompted to the physician is customizable. So we could add here a piece of text saying, you know, this is a new, this is a new guideline. Please take five minutes to take five seconds to have a look at it uh, in more detail. Well, so I invite people who have heard the comments or questions to come down. I want to let people get away because of the length of our sessions. Thank you very much for being here. I think it's a, a region we should be extremely proud to have a corporation like Medicalysis really coming up in a leadership function with the new health and the series to be here. And uh, nice knowing you guys too as well. Thank you very much.